everything that you've known about human anatomy ceases to exist and that babies now come out of butts. Hello to all of you beautiful birthing people. Welcome back to my channel. So my name is Elizabeth. I am a labor and delivery nurse, certified childbirth educator, mom to three, and I am known as Nurse Zabe here on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok if you want to follow me on any of those other platforms. But today I have an exciting video for you guys. It's actually going to be a series of videos called 10 Things nobody told me about today we're going to talk about labor i cannot tell you the number of times i get in my comments on youtube or instagram or in real life somebody saying oh my god i had no idea that this was even a thing i didn't know that this was a thing about breastfeeding about postpartum about having a cesarean birth and i want to reveal some of that mystery to you so that it is not a mystery anymore. Let's start with number one. I wanted to start with a doozy. Really, maybe we should count this down from 10 because number one, 10 centimeters is a freaking myth. You intrigued? You ready? When we tell people, okay, you can start pushing when you're 10 centimeters. When your cervix has dilated to 10 centimeters, you can start pushing. So let's break down a little bit of what that means. Dilation is the opening of your cervix. What is your cervix? The cervix is the neck of your uterus. It's the bottom part of your uterus that protects your uterus from the outside world of the birth canal in your vagina. It starts off closed or not dilated at all, zero centimeters dilated, and it goes to 10 centimeters. When I, as your labor nurse or your doctor or your midwife is assessing dilation, we use two sterilely gloved fingers inserted into the vagina and we feel the cervix to feel how open it is. Now, when we're first assessing it, when we're one, two, three, four, five, six centimeters dilated, we're kind of, we're doing our peace signs, right? We get to the point where instead of going in and being like, oh yeah, you're 10, you're nine, we start assessing how much cervix is left in front of your baby's head from about seven, eight centimeters onward. Are there two centimeters left all the way around? Is there one centimeter left all the way around? Or is there just one right at the top where you'd be like nine and a half centimeters dilated, also known as an anterior lip. But 10 centimeters dilated doesn't necessarily mean that if we took a ruler in there, which you can't anyway, bless, we would measure 10 centimeters. What it means is that there is no cervix in front of your baby's head. But where does your cervix go? We know that matter can neither be created nor destroyed because of science. When we're talking about the cervix, right, we have to remember that it's part of the uterus. Those of you who have been around for a while, you may remember when I wore my uterus sweater and I showed you how your baby kind of puts your cervix over their head like a turtleneck sweater. <laughs> Get out of here. Maybe don't put this on the internet. I'm being a uterus. I just don't put it as the thumbnail. It's not the thumbnail, okay? People are going to think you're like a member of some sort of cult. Unfortunately, that sweater is in storage, but same basic principle applies. So what your uterus is doing when it's contracting, it is it's squeezing this way and it is squeezing this way because your uterus is an amazing muscle and the muscle fibers run both ways to draw up the lower uterine segment and the cervix up and make the top of your uterus stronger, longer, and firmer to push baby down. And so in that way, when the baby's head is fully pushed through the cervix and the cervix is drawn back behind the baby's head, there is an absence of cervix, so you are fully dilated. But 10 centimeters isn't really a thing. Fully dilated is probably a better picture of what we're looking at because it's the absence of cervix that means that it is time, along with that natural inclination that you're gonna feel to bear down, to start pushing. Number two that I wanna talk about, since we're already talking about math and science, let's talk about time. When you are in labor, particularly active labor and transition, time also ceases to exist. Now, not actually, right? But in your head, in your body, 
a lot of times you won't know what time it is. And in many labor suites or labor rooms, you will notice that we don't have a clock readily available from the bed or even from the bathroom. A lot of times the clock is back behind your bed. This is so that your nurses can easily assess it for any emergent situations when they're noting times, but also because we don't want you to focus on the time. And if you're truly laboring and doing your thing with or without an epidural, you're not gonna know what time it is. You're not gonna know how much time has passed. You might look out the window and all of a sudden you're like, it's sunny outside, but I thought it was 3 a.m. And you have been doing this for hours and it's 6 a.m. So that loss of time is a really normal occurrence during labor and I think it also bears to note that you shouldn't be focusing on what time it is. Focus on doing one contraction at a time, focusing on just getting through the contraction that you're doing and knowing that you'll never have to do that contraction again. It doesn't matter if it's 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 3 a.m., 3 p.m. You're doing your thing and not knowing what time it is and not knowing what's going on around you is perfectly normal. You are in a completely different headspace when you're in labor and our job as your support person or as your nurse or as your doula is to protect you in that space and keep you focused on what you're doing and we take care of everything else in between. Another one I wanna talk about because I hear this so much. When it is time for you to push, when you are pushing your baby out, it feels like your baby's going to come out of your butt. It just does. It feels like everything that you've known about human anatomy ceases to exist and that babies now come out of butts. And there's a reason behind that, a couple of reasons. One, your baby's coming out of an area very close to your butt. Two, your baby is pressing on nerves that feel like you have to have a bowel movement. Three, if there is any stool in your rectum, you are going to push that out while pushing out your baby's head. Me personally, do not care. I love if you poop. Poop, poop away, because that tells us that you're pushing in the right spot, that tells us that you're doing your thing. My job is to be your poop ninja. I'm gonna wipe that poop away. I'm gonna tell you you didn't poop, unless you really wanted to know. I'm not gonna mention it. I'm just gonna clean everything up because I don't want you to feel self-conscious. When you poop, if you poop, you might poop. Poop, do your thing. Because that baby is gonna feel like you're pooping either way. With an epidural, without an epidural, it's gonna feel like you're pooping. So if you feel like you need to poop, you, you might need to poop, but more than likely, you probably just need to have a baby. Speaking of pushing, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about, especially after giving birth to their baby, beautiful baby up on their chest, yes, we did it. You unfortunately still have to give birth to your placenta. You still have to have something else come out of you. Now, great news about the placenta. It does not have bones. Bless. It comes out much more easily. The contractions that you experience to birth the placenta because there is no baby being pushed through are much less intense. There are two ways that your provider will kind of manage you birthing the placenta expectant management where they wait, or more active management where they might pull gentle traction on the cord to help the placenta come out. And one not, is not necessarily better than the other. With a skilled provider, the reason why they might do more active management is if they're worried about bleeding. Now, there are instances where that placenta takes a little bit longer to come out and your doctor might have to help a little bit more aggressively, or you might even need to go to the operating room and have it removed like with a DNC or a DNE because the placenta is not coming. And if the placenta doesn't come out, it does increase our risk of bleeding because the uterus's job after your baby comes out, after the placenta comes out, is to clamp down so that this big dinner plate size wound where the placenta was attached does not continue to bleed. Once your placenta comes out, your doctor is going to examine the placenta and make sure that it all looks like it's there, all of the membranes look like they've come out because if any membranes or little pieces of placenta are left inside, it can increase our risk of bleeding and also increase our risk of an infection postpartum in our uterus, both of which could be potentially life-threatening to you. So getting that placenta out in a timely fashion, we like to see it come out in about 30 minutes after delivery, is an important part of managing that final stage of labor. So in that period of time, when you're giving birth to your placenta, many, many, many of us have extreme shakes and these shakes are actually a response to adrenaline. 
often in labor when we get our epidural we can see some shakes or when we hit that 8 to 10 centimeter mark we can see some shakes and again it's that burst of adrenaline that happens in transition to kind of get us through to baby being born we want adrenaline at this point the rest of the labor we're trying to fend off adrenaline because it can interfere with the laboring process and with our pain control but once we hit transition, that natural burst of adrenaline actually prepares our baby to breathe outside the world. So we love adrenaline for that. But it does cause some really pesky and annoying shakes. And you're not cold, and if you try and stop it, they just get worse. So there are a couple of different tips and tricks I'm gonna tell you that might help with the shakes. One is you can kind of stick your tongue up and bite it. Sometimes that helps with the shakes. The other thing is there is a pressure point on the bottom of your foot that you can use press on both feet, that can sometimes help. I'm pressing just right in between the great and the second toe. Sometimes a warm blanket can also help with shakes, even though you're not actually cold, it'll kind of trick your brain, particularly if the shakes are after an epidural, but they are a normal and expected part of labor. They tell us some clues as to what might be going on with your labor, and they tell us that your body is preparing to get that baby out. Afterwards, you kind of almost have the shakes and a lot going on as you're coming down from that adrenaline rush, and it can feel really overwhelming. So sometimes after baby's born, particularly if you don't have an epidural, but even if you do, if you need a moment before we do the placenta, before we look and see if there's any repairs that need to be done, please say, okay, I need a moment where no one touches me. I just need to breathe. I need to kind of whew, process all this because there's a lot hormonally going on. There's a lot physically going on and it is really overwhelming. And those shakes can feel really overwhelming, but they are normal. The next one that I want to talk about is your water breaking. In movies and TV, this is always a really, really grand, big event, giant gush of water, ah, contractions start, you're freaking out, you're running to the hospital, you're about to deliver your baby. It's not normally that dramatic. Sometimes you're like, I don't even know if my water broke. Because it's really about where did your water break? How big was the break? Sometimes your water breaks and labor doesn't start for 12, 24 plus hours. At that 12 to 24 hour mark, your provider might encourage you to do some sort of labor augmentation to get labor started because of the risk of infection once your water breaks. But when we have a baby who's sitting in front of the cervix and the water breaks in front of the baby's head, we're gonna notice a bigger gush. Whereas if the water breaks up by baby's feet, it might be a slower trickle not really always very dramatic and not really always something that happens then all of a sudden we have a baby but if you are laboring and then your water breaks a lot of times labor does intensify because we have gotten rid of that extra cushion that uterus is able to work stronger and harder on the baby and also now it's the baby's head that is directly against the cervix instead of a bag of water but also also sometimes your water has to break twice sometimes it breaks up by the feet, we have some leaking of fluid, your water has broken, and then when your doctor or provider goes to check you, there is something called a four bag in front of the baby's head. So the baby's head is kind of refilled off a bag of water, and there is still a little bag of water in front of the baby's head. Speaking of water and water breaking, and things coming out of you, another thing that I think people don't realize is that when you have a baby, there will be blood. And not just at delivery, but sometimes, throughout the laboring process. Why is this? Your cervix is super vascular. And so as it's getting pulled back behind your baby's head, sometimes those blood vessels will break a little bit and we'll see a little bit of what we call bloody show. That can be a really good sign that we are having cervical dilation. Also, if you're sitting on the toilet and you put a drop of red food coloring in the toilet, it looks like a ton of blood. Now, too much bleeding can definitely be a thing during labor. We want to know if you're having vaginal bleeding, particularly if it would be filling up more than a pad in an hour. That is way too much bleeding. But a little bit of spotting, a little bit of pink tinge mucus, a little bit of brown tinge mucus, all perfectly normal parts of the laboring process that you do not need to worry about. So the next thing that I want to talk about is something that is near and dear to my heart. I think educating yourself about labor and delivery and breastfeeding and postpartum, so important so, so important. And the reason why, particularly educating yourself about labor and coping techniques to get you through labor and creating a little labor toolbox for yourself of all the things you're gonna try to help with contractions, even if you plan on getting an epidural are so important, is because you are going to need those 
before you get your epidural, you are more than likely going to experience some form of pain or discomfort that you're going to have to work through before an epidural is appropriate. And sometimes epidurals don't work 100%. Sometimes, particularly towards the end, you're still feeling a lot of pressure. Sometimes that epidural is working better on one side than the other. And we might need to bolus up that epidural, we might need to replace that epidural, but there's going to be moments when you need some coping techniques and strategies to work through. And that's why creating a labor toolbox is so important. I have a playlist on my channel about labor toolboxes. So what do I mean by that? How are we gonna breathe through the contractions? What are some different positions that we might try? Aromatherapy, TENS unit, the comb hack, all of these things can be put in your labor toolbox as a way for you to cope with labor because coping with labor isn't also just about dealing with the discomfort, but it's about getting your brain and your mind in a really good headspace to help the hormones that naturally are there to make our labor happen. And then the very last thing, number 10, things that people don't tell you about labor that I want you to know, are what we might do, what might happen if there is a deceleration in your baby's heart rate. So if you are on continuous monitoring or we are listening with the Doppler and we hear that there is a variation from the baseline in your baby's heart rate, so your baby's heart rate goes down, that can be for a whole maraud of reasons, and it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes we see decelerations when we have head compression when it's time for you to push, or when there's cord compression. Sometimes if there's a rapid dilation, we might see some decelerations in the heart rate. But if there is a deceleration in the heart rate that goes down, and then it's staying down for a little while, you are all of a sudden gonna have a bunch of people in your room because we are always watching out for you, watching out for our coworkers to make sure that we are keeping you and your baby healthy and happy and safe. And so what are some things that might happen during that moment that can feel really stressful when we've got all these people running in and maybe a lot of communication? Hopefully you have somebody communicating with you, but if not, these are the things that could happen potentially. So one of the first things that your nurse might do is change your position because sometimes babies get a little uncomfortable or their cord is having some compression. So they might turn you from side to side or even get you on hands and knees. The other thing that they might do is if you have Pitocin or any sort of labor augmentation medication running, that's gonna get shut off because we want to stop these contractions that are making your baby unhappy. The other thing they might do is give you a medication called terbutaline. This is going to be a shot in the fatty part of your arm. This shot can tell temporarily your uterus to stop doing contractions. This shot will make your heart rate feel like it's racing in addition to already feeling really stressed out. So know that that is normal. Another medication that we might use is a medication if you've just gotten an epidural, sometimes your blood pressure will go down and we wanna bring that back up. Baby can be really reactive to that because a lower blood pressure for you means less blood flow to the placenta for baby. And that can be a big thing that stresses baby out. Another thing that they might do is give you a fluid bolus, so a bolus of just IV fluid, so lactated ringers, normal saline through your IV. Another thing that they might do is to check your cervix and see, did we have a rapid dilation? Is it time to push and have a baby? Could the cord have come in front of the baby's head, which would be a medical emergency necessitating a cesarean birth? The other thing that they might do is give you some oxygen. This used to be a first line of defense. It's not so much anymore because it can create some extra free radicals that potentially could cause harm if oxygen is used long-term. But short-term oxygen might be used, particularly if you are having a drop in your oxygen saturations. Now, if all of these things have been done, all of these interventions have been performed, and we are still seeing that your baby's heart rate is not coming back up to baseline, it's still down, then we might consider a way that we can expedite delivery. So that could be if you're fully dilated and pushing using forceps, of course, with your consent or a vacuum to expedite delivery. The other thing that potentially could be done is a cesarean birth. So that's something where we're gonna have some conversations and they might be quick conversations with you depending on the severity of what's going on with your baby's heart rate. But I think knowing all of these things and knowing that most of the time those things that we do 
do help with your baby's heart rate and do bring it back up because we can help change the environment and make your baby happy again are really encouraging to hear. Again, I don't say any of these things to scare you or to freak you out about labor, but I want you to be prepared. I want you to know what's going to happen to you because I truly believe that if we have a knowledge and if we have support and we know what's happening, labor is so much less scary. And when we are less fearful in labor, it's gonna bring down our stress hormones, bring down that adrenaline, which is going to in turn bring up our endorphins, bring up our oxytocin so labor is going to flow as it should we're going to have that natural pain relief going as we should and we're going to welcome our babies in a much calmer environment yes emergencies happen but when we're prepared and when we have a team that's walking us through those emergencies they go much more smoothly and our brain processes them so much better as well which is a way that we can reduce trauma and ptsd associated with labor so the final thing, my number 11, it's cheesy, but it's true. You can do this. You were built to do this. And you have a team that is there to support you. Sometimes our plans change. Sometimes things deviate from the norm. But in general, like labor happens, you can get through it. You can do hard things. We were built to do hard things. And you're amazing. So that's the 10 things you didn't know about labor. I didn't know about labor until I was labor nerd for sure. Let me know if any of those things were surprises to you or any other surprises that you experienced in your labor down below. And until next time, bye guys.